it is something happening that makes me very unhappy. And what is it? Yeah, it is that we somehow don't see each other so much anymore. It has created a sort of so many situations where we can't see each other. And you see, for me, since my, yeah, in my whole life, I have been so preoccupied by seeing the other as a whole person. Yeah, I think it was from my childhood. I was very fond of my mother and wanted to see her all the time. But uh, more with my first study of criminology. And since I'm so enormously old, I have experienced the German occupation of Norway. I have also experienced something of the most terrible thing, namely, from the outside, the concentration camps. Uh, Norway was used to deport prisoners from Yugoslavia, Serbs mostly, to north of Norway. They were prisoners in uh, Yugoslavia in big camps, and they were exported in the Hitler plan of Nacht und Nebel, fog, and, or night and fog. And they come up to the north, very far up. We are living nearly to the North Pole, you know. If you bend Norway over, you end down in Africa. Here they came several thousand. In one ship there were many hundred. In that ship, many had died already, they came and uh, come ashore. And here came the Yugoslavians, thin and miserable, stinking because they had no toilets, big wounds. It was an awful sight. And then one of them, he was a school teacher, he found a dictionary on the ground, he took it up. And in the summer nights, it is uh, close to Nairvik, north of the polar circle. It's light all the night. He learned Norwegian. He knew German. He learned Norwegian from the dictionary. And uh, this is the sort of the episode of my life. He told me, one day they were marching out. It was seven Yugoslavian prisoners with uh, working equipment on their uh, shoulders. They should dig roads so Russia could be invaded. And it was a Norwegian guard in the front and a Norwegian guard in the back. And you see, this was horrible for Norway. I will come back to that. We had lots of Norwegian guards serving in the German concentration camps as guards, killers to a large extent. And then he said, I learned Norwegian sufficient, and here we walked, and it was one Norwegian guard behind and one in front, and the one in front cried out to the man behind, and he said it in Norwegian. He said, do you have a match? And the guard behind said in Norwegian, no, I have no match. But then the Yugoslavian, it was Serbian, cried out, in Norwegian. And that was the sentence that rescued his life. I have a match. What happened? He was converted from being a wild animal from Balkan to a human being. He could speak the language. He comes so close. And you can say much about Norwegians, but we don't kill to a large extent. And we don't kill people who we, that we see as human beings. And that is the essence in this. How do we, in a way, take care of each other in 
a way that makes it possible to see the other as a human being. And I think this has followed me uh, for my whole life, the importance of creating social systems, creating situations where we get an opportunity to see each other. As simple as that. See the whole person and not only a caricature described by some enemies. I followed up, I interviewed those who had been guards in these camps. And what was typical, I interviewed a group that had killed prisoners and a group that had never killed, at least not to over knowledge, and they were extremely different. What was again typical is that the non-killers, they could tell me, yes, they came, they had lived under terrible conditions, they were miserable, uh, they were afraid, they cried, and all that, while the killers never mentioned any such things, and a typical feature of their description would be that the killers had never experienced what the non-killers had, namely, the non-killers said, yes, and they showed me uh, pictures then of the family on the balcony in Beograd, and they showed me pictures of their wife, and they told me small bits and pieces. They were together with human beings. The other group, they swallowed the story of the horror, the horror of the, uh, this group of uh, Yugoslavians, and uh, they never saw them as individuals. Then, uh, if I continue with this, we can easily move to modern times. Yeah, before I move, I should say, Norway was so shocked by the fact that we were as bad as the Germans. So my story, I wrote it down, my story was completely ignored for, I think, 20 years. No, it is elevated to a sort of very important study, but not the first years. This killing of that type, that was not our business. That was the other that was a German business, but not for us. But we can. And there are no limits to what human beings can do against each other if the situation is of a special type, particularly when you don't see it. It's a famous American experiment where a man is giving electric uh, uh, shock to some people in the, in the neighborhood and it can even be dangerous, it is claimed, and it is pretended to be terrible because some people are trained to cry out in the neighborhoods. But the closer the person comes that is to be tortured, the less willing are these uh, people to do what they are ordered by the chief of the experiment. So, again, to be close to each other is so important. And here we can turn to another important, two other important factors. The one has to do on how we organize our ordinary life in cities, for example. Do we know each other anymore? Is it something in our industrialized life who make it so that we are ourselves enough. We don't need our neighbors. We don't need to know who they are. Or could we organize it in a way where the neighbors became very important? And very many studies indicate that we create a society where we get more and more distant vis-a-vis -vis the neighbors. What does this mean and how could we counter act. I think it's so important to try to, in a way, build down the big organization. Create them so 
that ordinary people get the responsibility for their close neighborhood and thereby are forced to participate. And what does it mean to participate? It means that you are able, you are forced to see the other. You might like or dislike her or him, but you are, cannot escape seeing him or her. And then you get some possibilities for being limited in bad thing you can do, and maybe you can increase your pleasures of the other person. But there are so many forces fighting that. For example, that force that, yeah, I don't know anything about the administration of this city, but I know the parallel administration of Oslo, uh, same number of citizens in these two capitals, as I said. In, search, in Oslo, we have split it up. Many functions are now decentralized. So as a citizen, I can take part in some decisions. And then it is important to become a politically active person. But uh, they have too little authority and it's not so very important. So my ideal and what I try to convince my homely uh, friends about is that we should uh, split up Oslo in 17 villages, nearly completely independent of the central authorities. Then it becomes important to take part, and then we break down distance. That is, to me, quite obvious. And there are many things that confirm that it is so. And then another thing, but I'm supposed not to talk too long, I suppose. But the other thing, so important, it is to give people in societies, give the conflicts back to them. It sounds mad. Shouldn't we have police and judges for that? No. I think we should try to handle much of this ourselves. What do I have in mind? I have in mind what they in English often call restorative justice, but uh, I like to call it uh, work in committees for caring for conflicts. That conflicts ought to be, that's a natural part of living together, that sometimes we are in conflict. And it's so important not to leave all these to lawyers or social workers or teachers, but get the parties to take part in their own conflicts. Yeah, why is that so? Yeah, because conflicts is a, to take part in that is an important possibility, again, for seeing the other. It is a, such a typical thing that happens in these meetings. When um, two persons meet, they agree, disagree on something. He maybe smashed the other's car or bicycle, it's more natural. Bicycle, and he's very angry, and the other is angry because uh, something. And then uh, in this case of conflict, if it had been on a police station or in a court, a penal court, one would have asked to the one who was seen as the most terrible one, why did you do it, you criminal? But in restorative justice or conflict handling bodies, the story is another. The story is, what happened? Can't you tell slowly, in detail, what happened with this bike? And why, why did it happen? The one is telling the story, the other is telling the story. And it is not an opening with offender and victim. It is an opening between human beings. And again and again I get reports from such meetings 
they come, come in as so angry that they will nearly spit at each other. And they leave with a wish to have the same elevator out of the floor. Because for us as human beings, it isn't always so important what happened with the material thing. It can be obviously also important, but it's another element. We are, in a way, all, uh, yeah, we are all scientists in the meaning that we are all interested in seeing what happens, interested in understanding. I was so struck by that, I've been relatively often in Latin America. This story I heard several times. It was an officer from Junta there, and it was one who had lost her husband or child. We have still grandmothers uh, in the center of uh, several of the Argentine cities, demanding to know where their grandchildren had gone. And what is then again and again striking is the enormous important importance to get to know what happened, to understand what happened. And on the more trivial level, in civil in, in cases in Scandinavia, as one has written a book about, how could you do it? It was a, uh, a case of rape. To understand makes it possible to live with money, many, uh, with many uh, awful occurrences. So, I've tried to say we should try to put the social system on a level where you can see each other. We have to try, when conflicts are there, to let people meet each other and thereby be able to understand more. And in your country with so many old conflicts, maybe Desmond Tutu or Nelson Mandela's ideas on uh, having commissions for trying to find out where officers meet victims have also an important uh, function. Or in you, with your turbulent earlier uh, history, that you can use some of this. Because when we come closer to people, we nearly always can see it is as something awful, heavy burden. It, it, go, it melts away. Oh, was that the reason? And we do it also systematically now, some, uh, some small, in small degree in my prison system, that some prisoners want very much to meet the victims. We had a famous case recently where a man who shot a policeman wanted so much to meet the family of the policeman, and the family wanted to meet him. And it was the same function of a sort of relief. It was possible to understand what happened and to get some sort of peace in one's mind when that was clarified. And it is probably also a good way of solving some problems. I prepared for coming here, so I looked at your prison figures. You have lots of prisoners in this country. You have the double number of what we have, and we are not more kind. But you have not used alternative ways of coping with some of this. So, uh, if I can initiate you to uh, think, is it really necessary to have so many uh, in prison as you have? Then maybe that could be useful, at least for some of those sitting in these prisons under 
Miserable conditions, as a prison always is, even the best ones. Punishment, that is intentionally to harm people. And if you would like to have to reduce harm in society, it's a good idea to try to press down the level of punishment in a society. I think I've said enough now. <laughs>